Well, thank you very much for being here, and welcome to Jazz on the Move here at the Frist. I'm Jamie Simmons, and I, I need to take a, a little bit of a, a chance here to introduce these gentlemen up here. Over on piano, Chris Walters. Back on the bass, my MTSU colleague, Jonathan Wires. On the drums, Duffy Jackson. <laughs> On the trombone, Roland Barber. <laughs> and on all these instruments, saxophone, clarinet, soprano saxophone. Did you bring your accordion? <laughs> good, good. Oh, you didn't bring it? Uh, Dennis Soli. Well, we are here tonight to celebrate Black History Month through celebrating the music of Louis Armstrong, who is perhaps the person who taught most of the jazz musicians of his day how to swing. And this is, there, there are different ways that you can talk about him, and we'll get into some of the details about his life. But he was really jazz music's first great soloist. You heard parts in that song where there was what we call collective improvisation. But Lewis 
would be the first one to really kind of take jazz music in the direction where the soloist uh, could express himself, herself, and be the one who kind of determined what the jazz solo was about. He was a, also a synthesizer of early styles. So there, were, there was hot music and there was sweet music. And he took the two and he joined them together. He uh, also joined uh, the uh, high and low sounds, of the sounds of New Orleans with society bands that he really liked. Uh, he was also, of course, a great trumpet technician, and he said that the trumpet is an instrument of temptation. So, <laughs> you know, you always want to play a little bit higher. You know, you want to play a little bit longer. There's always that temptation there that he had to deal with. Uh, he was a great showman, of course. We all know that. He said, you take an old ham actor like Satchmo, you press a button, and you got yourself a show. So he was an ambassador of the music internationally and nationally. He, uh, he was kind of an example, I guess the arctic, archetypical Horatio Alger kind of story. He was a born very poor and died rich, and Duke Ellington would say he didn't hurt anybody along the way. He taught, he taught like I said, many of the musicians how to swing, and we'll get into that a little bit later. He was born, well, he said his whole life that he was born on the 4th of July, 1900, but uh, it was found that he was actually born in 1901. And of course, he was, he was born near Storyville, which was the red light district of, of New Orleans. Right now, part of that neighborhood is where the Superdome is. So unfortunately, some of those neighborhoods are no longer existent. He was raised by his grandfather, his, uh, by his grandmother, his mother, and he had some musical experiences early on that were kind of formative, both those of sneaking over to the funky butt <laughs> to look through the crack in the door to see his uh, musical influences, which were Buddy Bolden, who's kind of this, how can I say it, kind of a legendary figure in jazz. He's a little bit mysterious. There are no recordings of him. There are rumors that there are, but uh, nobody's found him. But uh, he would go to hear him. He would go to hear uh, um, also another of his musical influences was King Oliver, who would la later hire Louis Armstrong to go to Chicago and play in his band. Well, uh, he also sang in his, the Sanctified Church, so that was an influence on him. And he sang in a boys' quartet out on the street for money when he was a, a boy. Uh, well, he and his friends were out on New Year's Eve one night, and he got the bright idea because the other boys had cap guns and were playing out on the street. He actually took his mother's real, don't do this, kids, <laughs> don't do this, uh, actually took some blanks and his mother's gun and was firing it out in the middle of the street on New, York, New Year's Eve and got arrested. Well, this totally turned his life around because Louis Armstrong actually, when he got to uh, the Colored Waifs Home for Boys, he, and I think there are some pictures we have up here, um, he actually took part in the brass band. And you can see Louis up there on top. He's the one with his, with his arm out like this. And um, he was very proud to be a member of that band. And a lot of the sources disagree, but I think he had a coronet shortly before he went to the boys' home. And there he is up there. You can see down below he's visiting there in the 30s uh, with some of the area musicians around New Orleans. And he went back many times to help with the work there that goes on at the boys' school. So um, he would make it through that with one of his main mentors was a trumpet teacher there named, named Peter Davis. Now, some people think that, you know, we're into education, jazz education for the money, uh, but it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. We do actually, we as teachers, we really love our students and want them to do well and they want music to be uh, a lifelong relationship that they can uh, be able to not only make a living, but express themselves. 
Well, Louis Armstrong would go on and um, as a sideman, he'd work in New Orleans for a number of years and later get hired on, you know, the kind of the narrative, right? Got hired on the Streckfuss uh, riverboat. And we can see a, maybe a picture of one of those. It's, it's kind of like the General Jackson, except, um, you know, not, not really. These were <laughs> huge, incredibly big boats. And they had, you can see a picture of the band that he toured with up and down the river, the Fate Marable Orchestra. And you can see Louis Armstrong next to the leader, the pianist Fate Marable, there with the cornet sitting right next to him. He'd work on, on those boats for a number of years. And uh, that was very important for him because a lot of, I would say, uh, some of the New Orleans musicians, not a lot actually, some of them never read music, but they played great. Um, but he, this is where he first learned how to read music and play in a section and do all those kind of musician. They called them musicianers in New Orleans, okay? <laughs> So kind of a fun, uh, fun thing there. Um, well, he works on those boats for a little while until he moves back to New Orleans and he gets a call from his main mentor in his life. And that was King Oliver. We call him King Oliver. His name was Joe Oliver. And he becomes a real father figure to Armstrong when he moves to Chicago for the first time. Chicago would be a base for a number of years. He'd meet his uh, first wife, or his, excuse me, second wife, Lil Harden, who actually wrote that first song that you heard, Struttin' With Some Barbecue. Um, and uh, recorded, started recording with Joe Oliver there. And you can hear behind Joe Oliver, you can hear Louis Armstrong playing second trumpet. Louis Armstrong was fine with that, but it bothered Lil, Har Lil Harden that he was playing second trumpet, that he deserved better. So arranged for Lewis, and this, guys, we're talking years here. I'm fast forwarding through a lot of really cool parts of his life. Uh, but he would go to New York to play with a dance band called uh, the Fletcher Henderson Orchestra. So he would go to New York, te basically teach the musicians there a lot about how to swing, how to feel the music, and make it more danceable. Suddenly this music starts to become less about maybe the interaction. It starts to be more about dancing. Ends up back in Chicago because Lil Hardin does not trust him alone in the big <laughs> city of New York. And starts recording. She already had recording contract set up for him before, she, before he came home. Here are two tunes that he recorded. Now, these are called the Hot Fives and the Hot Sevens. If you don't know these, go get them. Just buy them somewhere and put them on and enjoy them. Like I say, this is the first time a real great jazz soloist has um, been on the scene. And we're going to play two tunes. One, which is really, really hard, called West End Blues. And then the second one is called Potato Head Blues.
Hot fives and the hot sevens, if you just heard, uh, had a lot of innovation in those recordings. And some of that, what you could hear, actually you heard Chris over here doing a really great example of stride piano. And he had several really good pianists that he worked with throughout those years. One of them was Earl Hines. And uh, I'm going to have Chris do something because really jazz piano came from, it kind of came out of ragtime, and then it also came out of the blues. So uh, I'm going to have him demonstrate something. What, what's the difference between how you would hear a ragtime played by your grandmother in the parlor, <laughs> and what the difference <laughs> is between that and how a jazz musician would maybe go about what they called ragging it? Well, ragtime was kind of a forerunner to the stride piano. Uh, and ragtime a lot of times was more of a classically through composed music and it followed, the left hand followed the umpa of a marching band so you literally had pop, 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 that kind of stuff in ragtime such as Scott Joplin's Easy Winners. And so on. So it was like this umpa pa kind of thing. So stride, even though there was some syncopation, especially in the right hand of ragtime, uh, stride and the blues and the influence of uh, Caribbean music and so forth in the early 20th century brought the idea of stride and the rhythm of stride, that marching stride to, or marching ragtime um pa rhythm to uh, sometimes a calypso thing. Jelly Roll Morton would do a left hand, which was kind of a Latin thing, you know, in between. And also the stride term comes from piano players striding up and down the piano, usually in tents. So instead of this mm cha mm cha you're hearing. And the right hand and the left hand would have uh, different syncopations. So let's say uh, with uh, Easy Winners, a Scott Joplin composition, it might sound something more like this. Let's see if I can do this, actually. Something like that. Well, so that's you know one of the ways that on some of the recordings there's no bass player. There's actually uh, in the Hot Five sometimes it was just uh, piano and banjo. I think some of them maybe uh, piano and guitar. So the rhythm section was very flexible, and actually, so for us to have string bass on this is uh, we're we're playing string bass. We're being really scary here, bringing. <laughs> a later instrument into this music, but, you know, we adapt. And uh, Jonathan actually has been transcribing some of these bass lines. A lot of times, just like his two beat in the piano that he's doing, boom, chick, boom, chick. Sometimes, Jonathan, you only have, like, yeah. 
you know. But that's perfect because we can do all sorts of things that are syncopated against that. So that was just where the music was coming from. Sometimes you'll hear these uh, these guys in the rhythm section start playing more with what we call in swing music a four feel, and that's and play I don't know play the A, a section to honeysuckle or uh, uh, in your face. In your face, yeah, that's fine. Just play that in that four. Could you guys just call the first eight ba eight bars or so? One, two, a one, two, three, four. <laughs> Good. Now go into a two field. You hear the difference? Yeah, thanks guys. Well, Louis Armstrong in the 30s would move on to, like most everybody, every musician in the 30s that wanted to be a star and tour and play for dancers, they put together a big band. And this is what critic, critics of his music, like Gunther Schuller, he did not care for Louis Armstrong's 30s uh, recordings. He thought they were kind of, they were stiff, they were laborious. Um, I'll let you go listen to them all and you can des decide for yourself. I like, I like a lot of them. There's some uh, videos of him on the interweb of him. <laughs> him uh, with his big band. So you can go check, check those out. And this, it was hard leading a big band for, uh, for Armstrong. It was very stressful. He started having amateur problems. You can see in some of the pictures of him, a big callus start to form. And for a trumpet player, uh, that's, that's really, that's pretty rough when that happens. But there have been other trumpet players who really struggled with that. He started really breaking down when his band took a tour of England. When he came back from England, it was his career was at an all-time low, and he was trying to figure out what to do. So a new orga organization was formed. Um, as his big band started folding, he gave him the dreaded two weeks' notice. And when you're in you know, Wichita, Kansas, <laughs> your boss gives you two weeks notice, you start making plans. And he started making career plans too. He started recording more things with more of a swing based, uh, I guess you could say, a small group swing ensembles. And really these, these are, he starts with this group becoming, with his big band and this group, a peddler of songs almost. He starts using the Great American Songbook, all those great standards. And uh, we're going to play a, a couple of these two. Actually, we're going to play three tunes in this kind of the style. Uh, I'm taking one of them from the album, which was my first Louis Armstrong uh, album. It was uh, Satch Plays Fats. And you're going to get to hear Dennis take the vocal part on Ain't Misbehavin'.
all by myself. No one to walk with me on a shelf. Ain't misbehaving, saving my love for you. I know for certain the one I love. I'm through with flirting. It's you I'm thinking of. Ain't misbehaving, saving all my love for you. Like Jack Horner in a corner, don't go nowhere. What do I care? Your kisses are worth waiting for. Believe me, I don't stay out late, don't care to go. I'm home about eight, just me, my radio. Ain't misbehaving, saving all my love for you. Soli. <laughs> Going to go on and play another uh, another tune, and it's I want to say it's the All Stars. He wrote this in I think 1946. He wrote it for his third wife that left him. <laughs> And uh, it's called Someday You'll Be Sorry. <laughs> he wrote it for his ex-wife, Alpha, who died in 1943, after she had already left him. Um, they divorced. And four years later, he wrote the tune saying the song had come to him in a dream. And he said, it wasn't just that song. It was like a whole opera. There must have been a dozen songs there, complete with words and music, but Someday was the only one I was able to write down. So that's where this comes from.
How about it for Roland Barber? Chris Walters on the piano. Jonathan Wires on the bass. Now I have to introduce the next tune by saying that I found this actually through just looking through a Louis Armstrong uh, discography. And in the back of this discography, it has a list of all the players that played in Louis Armstrong's Jazz All-Stars. And looking through, okay, it has drums, okay. Piano, okay. Bass, Chubby Jackson, which this is our, our link to Lewis's music today is through Duffy's father, who um, played, got to play on tour, I think I have the dates, March 19, or January through March 1954. And, and I'm going to let Duffy talk a little bit about uh, that experience for his dad. This w and next, we're going to play a tune that um, his dad recorded with Louis Armstrong. You know, my dad was uh, famous for playing in Woody Herman's big band in the 40s. And, um, you know, in the 50s, uh, Louis called my dad and said, hey, come on out on tour and everything. And my dad was very successful with Louis for, I don't know, uh, a year or more. And then my mom said, hey, you got to come home and help take care of, <laughs> you know, the kids. I had an older sister, and I was a handful even then. <laughs> but uh, but uh, my dad had a wonderful time. Let me also say that uh, Joe Glazier was um, uh, Lewis's uh, manager for many, many years. And he actually saved his life from a couple of situations in Chicago with some gangsters that uh, felt they had contracts on Lewis. Uh, Joe saved him, and I think he took 50% too, uh, forever. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, you know, uh, Joe Glazier called my dad in uh, 1967, 68, whenever it was. And I was 14 at the time. And Joe said, hey, Lewis wants to go out on the road and do a six-week tour, and he'd like to know if you and your son would like to accompany uh, him on the tour. And I was 14, and I was ready to go. <laughs> I was going to school in uh, Fort Lauderdale at the time, and uh, around four days before we were going to fly to New York to rehearse, uh, Lewis passed. So I came this close. <laughs> Picture where would, I, where, I, where would I be if I would have played with Lewis at 14? But, you know, I just uh, want to mention that uh, there were some tremendously gifted drummers that uh, played in uh, Lewis's bands through the years. Big Sid Catlett. Uh, was one of my favorites, and um, there was a guy, uh, Danny Barcelona, that played uh, with the band in his later years. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there was a guy by the name of Barrett Deans. I don't know if you know that name. Check him out. He actually had chops faster than Buddy Rich, which is <laughs> unheard of, you know. But uh, he billed himself as the fastest drummer in the world. And, and uh, you know, uh, Barrett Deans had a big band until his uh, last days, and he also had his hair all the way down to here, like Wild Bill Hickok or something. You know, he was an amazing guy. He ate Chinese food seven days a week. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I got to meet uh, Barrett Deans in Chicago uh, when I was in town in the 70s, uh, and what a gracious gentleman, and all the marvelous stories that he related about Lewis. Uh, it was like a whole history of just sitting there and listening. But uh, there are so many secrets to the music of the past, and I know you all know what those secrets are. So, But uh, that's why I'm trying to carry on the legacy of just stimulating, a, a, you know, putting a grin on the groove and aiming to beat at your feet. <laughs> and that's what Lewis was all about. He would make you dance, you know. And uh, I love to scat, like, like Lewis and Ella and everything. So and anyway, um, I... I'm very honored to be here this afternoon playing with all these virtuoso musicians and to pay tribute to Lewis. Thanks, Duffy. Just to explain uh, this next tune, it's really the closest that Louis Armstrong got, with maybe a few exceptions, to playing bebop. 
this by the 1940s and 50s kind of an, an animus against Louis Armstrong on the on the part of bebop musicians and uh, you know, they called called him a moldy fig and all sorts of different things and didn't really understand his music but uh, this is probably the closest he got to playing on a, on a bebop tune and it's called Snafu and it has an interesting lineup on the recording. Billy Strayhorn is on piano and a great tenor sax player named Don Bias who was one of his uh, one of the swing era kind of transitional figures to bebop. So we're gonna feature we're gonna feature Dennis on this one and it's called Snafu. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Thank you. 
much was said of, of Armstrong's Uncle Tommy, his mugging, his, uh, his behavior was always, people like Miles Davis were extremely critical of uh, Louis Armstrong. And so was Dizzy until the end of his life. And, and Dizzy should know better because he <laughs> clowned around all the time on stage. And, uh, and finally he, he understood that uh, Louis Armstrong was just trying to experience joy among all the pain. Um, he, Lewis said this, he said, I think that I've always done great things about up uplifting my race. Some folks, including some of my own people, have felt that I'm not, that I'm soft on the race issue. Some have even accused me of being an Uncle Tom or not being aggressive. How can they say that? I've pioneered in breaking the color line in many southern states. I've taken a lot of abuse, put up with a lot of jazz, even in some pretty dangerous spots through no fault of my own for 40 years. So some of the things he did, if you read about them, are, are pretty serious. He, put, he was the first uh, black entertainer to put in contract that he would play no place I couldn't stay. I cracked the white hotels. Now whether that's 100% correct, uh, maybe not, but he did do that. Um, he did lead an integrated band throughout the 40s and 50s. And this made it really hard on the band to tour. Uh, because often, well, here's something that uh, Barrett Deems actually said, the drummer that Duffy was talking about. The road manager and I were the only two white guys in the organization. Here's Lewis with five or 10 grand in his pocket, his wife with a $20,000 mink coat, and they both had to sleep in a gymnasium in North Carolina because they couldn't find accommodations. That was a killer. It takes the heart out of a man. I used to ask Joe Glazer why he booked us down south. He never answered, but I knew the answer. He wanted the money, and Armstrong never complained. So um, this is also what he said. I have my own ideas about racial segregation. I've spent half of my life breaking down barriers through positive action and not a lot of words. I don't socialize with the top dogs of society after a dance or concert. Even though I'm invited, I don't go. These same people may go around the corner and lynch somebody, but while they're listening to our music, they don't think about trouble. What's more, they're watching a Negro and white musicians play side by side, and we bring contentment and pleasure. I always say, look at the nice taste we leave. It's bound to mean something. So. That's what he had to say. Now those in public that thought of Lewis in this way were occasionally surprised when a different side of Armstrong came about, when his temper flared, or when he finally spoke out about school segregation in Arkansas. When the governor of Arkansas blocked the Supreme Court decision to allow, uh, to allow uh, desegregation, Armstrong told a reporter, the president, who was Eisenhower, is two-faced and has no guts, and that the governor is a no-good <laughs> expletive. He also insulted the Secretary of State, calling him, I think, a, a plowboy, and canceled his official State Department tour to Africa. He was quoted in the paper as saying this, and later Eisenhower, although he didn't really think like this, I don't think, that we can't credit Armstrong's action to this, but he did send in the National Guard to end segregation in Little Rock. Armstrong did end up being one of the biggest musical ambassadors to places like East Germany, and which was a communist bloc at that time, and Africa in 1960. Though many were surprised that jazz musicians were sent into the communist bloc while water can cannons were being aimed at marchers in Selma. Many musicians, Ellington, Brubeck, Armstrong, talked to foreign journalists, quite frankly, about their frustrations with race relations. So this was a very turbulent time, but yet Louis Armstrong had some very big popular hits, and we're going to play one of them right now, and you probably know it very well, and I think I've played this on just about every single wedding gig I've ever played. <laughs> so I tried to do it in a way that would be a little bit different, remembering the things mo some of you remember those, the times in the 60s. Um, 
and I arranged this with that in mind. This is What a Wonderful World. to myself what a wonderful world oh
Chris Walters. How about one more time for the guys, Duffy Jackson. Jonathan Wires. Roland Barber. Dennis Soley. Thank you so much. Well, it's been very good to have you here. We have one really quick one. Yeah. And I thank you all for being here. Thank you to Roger and Lori and everybody at the workshop who works so hard on these events. Uh, thank you to the Frist. And why don't you, yeah, go ahead. Give the <laughs> National Jazz Workshop. Thank you so much. We're going to take it out with uh, our celebration here, Cornet Chop Suey.